with this we come to the end of whatever uh, we wanted to cover and discuss about in motors and uh, before signing off I will just quickly take you through a recap of whatever we learnt. We started by looking at what is called flow and uh, flow has only three common phenomena associated with it. One is Ohm's law, another is like conservation of mass uh, which is called Kirchhoff's first law and the second phenomenon is conservation of energy which is called Kirchhoff's second law. And if we understand these three things, we can pretty much describe all the flows that uh, occur in nature and we discussed the seven different flows that play out in a motor. And the next thing that we looked at is about power and efficiency, how conversion of power from electrical to mechanical and uh, happens in a motor and then the mechanical power from the motor is translated into translational uh, mechanical power at the vehicle and along the way at every stage there are different kinds of losses and uh, efficiency is a measure of how much useful output gets delivered compared to the input and efficiency will always be less than 100 percent. And then we went into some depth about torque production, uh, torque happens because electricity passing through a wire results in a force acting on the wire if the wire is in a magnetic field. And this idea we extended by turning the wire into a loop and then we got torque and then we also explored a very interesting uh, phenomenon where merely the presence of steel in a magnetic field can cause what is called reluctance torque and we said we will go with I PMSM architecture for the motor because it gives us significant amount of magnetic torque and also a good deal of reluctance torque. So, the overall torque production is very optimum in that and uh, when we try to optimize between magnetic and reluctance torque then we are really optimizing something called the phase advance angle and that algorithm we called it as MTPA maximum torque per ampere. And just as torque is related to the current we found that the voltage is linked to the speed. If I increase the voltage the motor will run at higher speed, if the motor runs at higher speed it will demand a greater voltage and this comes because of what is called back EMF which is produced when the rotor is rotating and the reason for the production of back EMF is uh, Faraday's law. And because of this um, back EMF uh, and the waveform associated with the back EMF, we also noted that there is something called electrical speed which is different from magnetic speed, uh, yeah magnetic speed the both are related, but they are different and what relates them is that the electric field is p times the magnetic speed where p is the number of pole pairs, mechanical, hmm? Me mechanical I am sorry mechanical speed. So, omega e and omega m e is the electrical speed and the mechanical speed thanks for correcting they are linked by the parameter p given by the pole pairs. And uh, then we looked at what is called the dq equivalent circuit. Uh, which helped us to draw the motor as if it were a pair of DC motors and uh, DC is what we prefer because DC makes control easy and uh, so we have one circuit diagram for the D axis, another circuit diagram for the Q axis and the vector sum of the voltages in the two we developed a pair of voltage equations. The vector sum of the pair of voltages is the actual physical uh, AC voltage that is getting applied in the stator. And uh, based on this understanding using the DQ equivalent circuit we were able to define what is the current limit and therefore from it what is the rated torque. And then what is the speed limit defined by the voltage limit up to which we can get the rated torque. So, there is a certain rated speed up to which I can get the rated torque both of these are derived from the current limit and the voltage limit and if we want to push the envelope of operation beyond the rated speed then there is this nifty technique called flux weakening by which I can push 
the operation and make it run at significantly higher speeds for some loss of torque. And with this knowledge we went into looking at how the controller works, the controller works uh, in the, the control part of the controller works in the DC domain because DC values are what can be controlled. We talked about what is called PI control uh, and the method of control is just nothing but MTPA on the one hand and flux weakening on the other. The combination of these two is all that is involved in the control, but all of this is in the DC domain. But then when we have to apply it on the motor which is an AC motor, we have to convert the uh, values computed by the field oriented control algorithm, we have to take the DC values and convert them into AC values and for that uh, we used what is called the Clark and Park transform in the forward and the reverse directions uh, to transit from DC to AC and then back from AC to DC. Um, so, and then finally, we looked at thermal design. Uh, how the um, where heat is produced, how heat is evacuated, what can be done to improve it, how can we estimate the resistances along the way and from that how can we arrive at the temperature profile and judge whether the peak temperature is within acceptable limits or not. And lastly we looked at a number of engineering considerations. Uh, about magnets, about selection of magnets, about noise, about balancing, uh, ripple torque, things that we have to be mindful of while manufacturing like shaft collar, wavy washers and other things. And uh, so, before I sign off, I will just uh, spend a couple of minutes in uh, look uh, highlighting some sort of cutting edge areas which are being researched upon all over the world, uh, these are the future frontiers in uh, motor design. Uh, the first of these is uh, about the problem with rare earths, rare earths are available in very few places, India also has some deposits, there are some deposits in the US, there are deposits in Australia, there are significant deposits in China. Um, but only China knows how to extract the metal from the ore, nobody else knows. Uh, so, part one of manufacturing of uh, magnets is extraction of the metal, part two is once the metal is extracted how do you magnetize, that is something that is reasonably more widely known, that is also a kind of difficult technology, but uh, India can do it, uh, that is not a problem, but extraction of the metal is a very difficult thing and also it is a very expensive thing, uh, it is very difficult to extract it is available in very rare uh, quantities which means the percentage concentration of the metal is very small. So, it is a very expensive uh, set of materials that is why they are called rare earths and uh, in that context there is interest in something called synchronous reluctance motors. Um, so, just to give you a picture of uh, rare earths uh, why we are so concerned. Um, in a few years ago within a span of something like an year 20 to 25 fold increase in neodymium which is the important metal for making rare earth magnets happened. And you can see that you know uh, it is uh, price rose up to almost 500 dollars per kilogram and an even rarer met, uh, metal which is about 10 times more expensive maybe 8 times more expensive. Uh, as neodymium uh, is, uh, is what gives it thermal stability. It is used in very small quantities compared to neodymium, but it is also almost 10 times more expensive and if I do not add dysprosium then the temperature stability of the rare earth magnet is very poor. So, this volatility in price in fact, as I speak the volatility has again started because of tensions between US and China and uh, today if you approach a magnet manufacturer he will give you a quotation which is valid for only 2 days because he does not know what the price will be after that. The prices are just fluctuating up and down 
so, this brings a lot of uncertainty to the uh, to people involved in uh, electric vehicles and motors all over the world. And uh, in this context, we discussed about reluctance torque and magnetic torque. Uh, reluctance torque is produced by the reluctance and magnetic torque is produced by the magnetic flux coming from the permanent magnets. And uh, we had said that we will uh, not use surface permanent magnets uh, because they do not produce any reluctance torque. We instead opted for what is called the IPM where a significant amount of surface permanent magnet torque is there and also a reasonable amount of reluctance. But if I look at the two coordinates, the one coordinate being synchronous reluctance torque and the um, uh, other coordinate being magnetic torque, I can actually design different kinds of motors at, at different places on this plane and something like this has very little magnet and actually weak magnets, you do not need rare earths and something like this has absolutely no magnets at all. So, that would be called a purely synchronous reluctance motor, something in this region will be a permanent magnet assisted synchronous motor, but the assistance can be obtained from normal ferrite magnets, you do not require rare earths. So, it is actually a design continuum, it is not like there is one category of permanent magnet and another which is without magnets, you can have a transition. And the most promising from sort of nearness of commercial viability will be one which takes the help of some magnets, but largely dependent on reluctant stock. The challenge really is can a rare earth free magnet deliver high efficiency and high density of torque and power not become very large and bulky. This is an area of active uh, research and uh, so as I told you uh, this will be the kind of rotor that will have no, no magnets at all and these are uh, rotors where there is a little bit of weak magnets uh, that is called the PM assisted magnet and this is how a PM assisted magnet would be uh, assembled those little magnets are going into the slots. What you can see here is that this is the d axis and as you can see in the d axis there are large air pockets and magnets are as good as air or as bad as air in terms of reluctance. So, this entire place has a very high reluctance which means very low permeance and n squared into permeans is the inductance. So, L d is very low and here you have the q axis which is a very thick band of steel and so L q is very high and if L q is much larger than L d then the saliency is very high that is what it means. So, the L q by L d which is a saliency can be as high as 11 or 10 in that range. Uh, whereas, in our uh, normal IPM magnets the saliency is in the range of 2 that means, L q is 2 times L d. Uh, so, we can bump up that ratio therefore, generate a large uh, amount of uh, reluctance stock. And another area which is very interesting is what is called axial flux motors. Uh, here the magnetic lines are parallel to the axis of rotation which is very funny and uh, this is a rotor and this is a rotor both the rotors they are like slices uh, with magnet magnetic poles facing each other and in between is sandwiched the um, stator with the windings and the at the core of every winding in the conventional architecture we saw that the core is the teeth uh, of the stator here the teeth are also axially oriented parallel to the axis and uh, the, um, the there are a lot of mechanical challenges because the static portion is in the center and around it the um, uh, rotating portion is there and you have to take the wires through a hollow in the shaft and things like that um, the interesting thing is that this picture is taken from a particular IEEE paper 
and uh, with a 300 mm diameter the example that we looked at for the current limit which gave a rated torque of 22 Newton meter and uh, speed rated speed of 3500 rpm the diameter was something like 125 mm and the length of the stack was 60 but the motor itself will be almost 150 mm long because there are overhangs and then the housing and the end cover and everything. So, the real motor length will be 150 mm but the stack is only 60 and the torque that we got there was 22 Newton meter and the speed we got was 3500 and the power that we got rated power was 8 kilowatt 22 Newton meter into this I am just giving you a comparison between the radial and the uh, axial. Here you see that a phenomenal torque is being obtained and interestingly that other example was of 160 amperes and 48 volts whereas here the voltage is about 3, 3 and a half times more. So, we are getting a reasonably high speed of 2600 rpm because the voltage is high if we had only run it at 48 then we will probably we will probably get only one third of the speed uh, say about 900. Uh, so, in a very compact form factor it is like a sandwich slice uh, we get a very high torque um, and that is the advantage of an axial flux motor and uh, at the moment uh, uh, we my team uh, is building uh, an axial flux motor which actually will do the opposite it will uh, it will give a very low torque 0 0.02 Newton meter but its speed is 20,000 rpm it is for an industrial application not an EV application and its diameter is something like 65 and its length is something like 20 mm and the power will be less than 40 watts not kilowatts watts. Um, so, the axial flux topology is suited for very high torque and low speed application it can also be adapted to very high speed and low torque applications. Uh, so, this is another area and uh, lastly I will just take you through another concept that uh, our team is working on how to apply artificial intelligence in the design of motors. Uh, conventionally the design of motors involves coming up with concepts that is the act of creativity of the designer. Uh, it is almost a miraculous act without any rationale it comes from intuition it comes from experience and things like that and we try to perform calculations based on the design concept and uh, we already discussed that continuity equation is Kirchhoff's first law energy conservation is Kirchhoff's second law there is also a momentum term all of these are common to all flows we can apply it to all the flows that we discussed in the motor also. But this is a 200 year old set of equations which has not been solved till today because they are very complicated only special cases have been solved. So, uh, analytical calculations will only take us up to a certain distance and then we will hit a uh, hit against a wall. So, the next thing that we will do is we will just uh, set up a schema in which millions of calculations per second can be done by a computer and then it will give us results. And this is all right we will get the results, but we will not get much insight. Supposing I say hey I am finding that there is a little discoloration over here I do not want it. I only know that it is there, but I do not know how to get rid of it. So, using my guesswork again I will make some changes in the design again go through the uh, simulation and see whether the thing has gone away, but the computer itself will not be able to tell me that because of this you have got this. Uh, temperature profile there and you have to change it. Um, so, what we do is we get the results we start with the design we actually start with some requirements in the design process then we come up with a design which we think will meet the requirements and then we go through a very elaborate sequence of activities to get a result that verifies if my requirements are met or not. So, when I get the results I have to compare it with my requirements and see whether the results are ok usually they are not some things will be ok some things will not be then what do I do always I think of something should be improved this is not quite ok I want a little bit more efficiency oh this temperature not good 
many things I will find problematic. <coughs> so, what do I do after this? If I am not satisfied with the results, I have to again start from the beginning after making some changes. So, this is a very tedious process of iterative design trial and error. And finally, when the design nearly matches my requirements, I say okay, now it is it is fine, it is time to just go on, let us start making it. So, what you see here the dotted lines are the results of the design, whereas the uh, plain lines are the original requirements I started with. And it is matching in some critical parameters it is matching, but there are some deviations. Uh, it is all right, I can live with it. I am getting a slightly less talk than what I wanted. I wanted 49, but I am getting 47, it is okay. Chalega. So, this is a sort of compromise way of uh, designing. And if I wanted to improve this further, then I do not know whatever I have, I have already done some 10 cycles, 10 iterations of design, and whatever is obvious. I have changed, I have changed some geometry, I have changed the air gap, I have changed the winding pattern, number of turns, whatever I was easy to do I have done. Now, it is very complicated, uh, if I do anything to improve one thing, something else will get affected. So, it is not clear what I can do. Uh, so, this is where the question is can we use AI, the approach is that we do not come up with a design, we only specify the requirements to the AI system and the AI system generates designs that meet the requirements. Uh, we hope it will be able to do it in a manner that is much more aligned to the design requirements than a uh, iterative and unpredictable human effort. And uh, for any AI system we first have to train the system by showing it a large number of examples. Now, we do not have millions of motors for example, in face recognition to distinguish between the face of a dog and the face of a cat millions of terabytes of photographs are fed to the system. We do not have so many motors um, to experiment and generate data and feed it to the AI system, but what we can do is we can generate some uh, samples by doing designs using the conventional uh, FEA solvers. And we also know for example, you already know that inductance is proportional to the square of the number of turns. So, if I have design results for one which I write in the form of a row in a spreadsheet one column for every parameter, then if I change the number of turns from two turns to let us say three turns, then I know that the number of turns is multiplied by one and a half, then the inductance will increase by 2.25. So, just by changing one parameter I have generated one more design I can go on like that. So, the, this method by looking at one design and similar design I can generate by changing some parameter that is called similitude. I can use that to multiply the number of designs I have and also each design can be made to run at different operating conditions of torque, speed, ambient temperature and other things and I can generate further more. So, I can generate a few thousand designs without too much effort not millions but we do not need millions in this case because the variability in behavior in the case of say natural phenomena like uh, biological phenomena like dogs and cats and their faces and skin color and fur is very wide, but here a tight set of physics is integrating the behaviors. And uh, having decided uh, how to generate data, how do you provide the data to the AI system you can define it as an image or as a vector. Uh, different frameworks take different forms of inputs, we can provide it in whatever form that is appropriate. There are different architectures of uh, AI which I would not go into in detail because there is not a course on artificial intelligence and we are still evaluating the options of which uh, framework will work best for our application. Um, so, with this we come to the end of the course, thank you all. Uh, I think um, young professionals like you, uh, it is very uh, heartwarming that you are all uh, enrolled for this course and uh, in India is probably going to be one of the largest markets 
for electric vehicles and even today even if you look at a category like rickshaws uh, every year 1 million or more than a million rickshaws are getting added and every one of them runs on imported motors and controllers which is a shame just like we are one of the largest markets for cell phones but all our cell phones are imported. Uh, so, but since this is a very early stage of the wave in uh, electric vehicles I am sure uh, smart people like you if you join this effort early on we can uh, build every motor and controller needed for India and for the world uh, here in India design as well as build. Thank you.